living in a house where you spent millions of dollars on the strongest steel front door in the world. You have biometric scanners, armed guards, and thermal cameras pointing at the door. You feel safe. You tell your investors you are safe. But then you wake up one morning to find your living room has been ransacked. The steel door is still locked. The guards didn't see a thing. But why? Because you left the bathroom window open. And not only did you leave it open, but the person who you hired to check the window was actually a thief wearing a fake uniform. This isn't a hypothetical story. This is the exact reality. Amazon Web Services, the backbone of the modern internet, just admitted to. They recently disclosed a dual front attack. On one side, Russian military intelligence is walking through the open windows that companies forgot to lock. And on the other side, the North Korean operatives are getting hired as remote IT workers using fake identities to tunnel into corporate networks from the inside. This isn't just a tech update. It is a signal that the way we build the internet, the architecture you have trusted for 30 years is fundamentally broken. And no amount of patching, updates, or firewalls can fix a foundation that is cracked. And today, we're going to walk through why the current model reached its limit. And we're going to look at the only technological shift that solves this problem at the root. It's not about buying a better lock. It's about rebuilding their house. And most people think of cybersecurity as a battle between hackers and antivirus software. We have this movie-style idea of a guy in a hoodie typing furiously against the firewall. But the reality is much more boring and definitely much more dangerous. The reality is about economics and structure. Because for the last few decades, we have built our digital world on a model called client-server. You are the client, Amazon, Google, Microsoft is the server. They rent you the hardware, but you are responsible for the data. It's a shared responsibility. And that sharing is where the cracks are forming. And Amazon's recent disclosure is not terrifying because the hackers use some futuristic, unstoppable code. It's terrifying because they didn't have to. The Russians used simple misconfigurations, human error. The North Koreans used the hiring process, the human deception. And this tells us that the weak link isn't the computer, it's the human administrator. And I'm going to take you through what is actually happening behind the scenes of this digital war. We're going to look at the IT stack, the tower of software that runs the world and why it is collapsing under its own weight. But more importantly, we're going to explore the solution because there is a shift happening and move away from trusting people to configure servers towards a protocol that does it automatically. We are going to explore why technology like the internet computer isn't just another crypto project, but a necessary evolution of IT infrastructure that eliminates the very attack vectors Amazon is warning us about. This is a story about how we move from a fragile internet to an, an indestructible one. It's a long journey. So let's get started. Let's look at what actually happened. Because of details, Amazon security leadership released a report detailing a five-year operation. One part of this threat comes from a group known as Sandworm, linked to Russian intelligence. Now, historically, when we hear state-sponsored hackers, we think of zero-day exploits, expensive, complex digital weapons that no one has ever seen before. But that's not what happened here. Explicitly states that they didn't use sophisticated backdoors. They targeted misconfigured edge devices. Let me explain what an edge device is in simple terms. Imagine, say, a massive corporate headquarters. The core is obviously the CEO's office or the main vault, but the edge is, say, the printer in the lobby, the thermostat in the hallway, or the router in the branch office. These are devices that sit on the perimeter. And the current cloud model, say, a company might have thousands of these devices. Each one has, say, settings, passwords, access lists, permissions. And say, if a human administrator forgets to change the default password on just one of those thousands of devices, that is an open window. And the Russians realized they didn't need to blow up the vault door. 
they just need it to find the one window the janitor left unlock. It is a strategy of weaponized negligence. They're exploring the fact that humans are bad at boring, repetitive tasks like checking settings. Then there is the second front, obviously, the North Korean ghost workers. Because this is fascinating and also frightening. The report details how operatives are applying for more remote engineering jobs at Western tech firms. They aren't just making up names. They are stealing the identities of real qualified engineers. They have the resume, they have the credentials, and they pass the interview. Once they're hired, they are inside the walls. They don't need to hack the firewall because you gave them the login. Amazon blocked 1,800 of these attempts recently. But think about that number. That's 1,800 attempts at just one company. They're even using laptop farms, say, in the United States. They ship the corporate laptop to a house, say in America somewhere, where a mule turns it on. The North Korean operative connects to it remotely from North Korea to the company's security team. It looks like the employee is logging in from, say, Texas, Ohio, Chicago. This is the failure of the perimeter defense model. We spent 30 years building a castle wall to keep the bad guys out. But what happens when the bad guys are already inside wearing a company badge? To understand why this is happening, we have to look at the IT stack because this is the invisible structure that runs every app on our phones and every website on our computer or laptops. And right now, if you want to run, say, a secure application on the cloud, you are building a Jenga tower. At the bottom, you have the hardware, the servers. Amazon takes care of that. On top of that, you have the operating system, usually, say, Linux, for example. You have to secure that on top of that. You have the database, you have to password protect that. On top of that, you have the web server. On top of that, you have the firewall. And on finally, on top of that, you have your actual application code. But here is a problem in every single layer of the Jenga tower. It needs to be maintained by a human. The operating system needs security patches. The database needs access controls. The firewall needs rules. In the industry, we call this the shared responsibility model. It sounds fair, right? Amazon secures the cloud. You secure what's in the cloud. But in practice, it's a trap. They mean that for every application you build, you have to be perfect. You have to get every setting right every time forever. The hackers, they only have to be right once. The Russian campaign proves that this model is failing. Companies cannot hire enough security engineers to constantly check every single layer of that Jenga tower. It is mathematically impossible to be 100% secure when you rely on human vigilance. I want to share a story from our time working in traditional finance at a large financial firm that really highlights this issue. I remember working on a project where we were migrating legacy systems to a new server. And it was a new environment. This was a massive institution. I'm not going to go to the name where I work. The kind of place with endless compliance budgets. We had a team of 20 people just in my department whose only job was to verify access controls. Basically, checking who had the keys to the room. We spent weeks auditing. But on the day of the launch, there was a minor issue. And a junior developer, he temporarily opened up a specific network port to debug. The problem here was he meant to close it five minutes later. He went to lunch and he forgot. For many hours, a multi-billion dollar system was exposed. Nothing happened, thankfully. But when the order team found it later, the panic was absolute. And the lesson I learned that day stuck with me. Policies don't stop mistakes. You can have all the rules in the world, but if the system allows a human to make a mistake, and we're all humans, we all make mistakes, the mistake will eventually happen. And in finance, we rely on reconciliation, checking the work after it's done. But in cybersecurity, you can't reconcile after the fact. Once that data is stolen, it's gone forever. We need a system that prevents the window from opening in the first place. This is critical. So if the problem is, say, the Jenga tower of layers that humans have to manage, what is the solution to the Jenga tower? The solution is to collapse the tower. We need to move from an architecture managed by the network, the protocol itself manages the security. It replicates that box across multiple independent machines around the world. But here is why this matters for the Russian threat. In this model, there is no edge device to misconfigure. 
There is no operating system for Hackup to log into. There is no root password that gives someone total control. The current cloud model is a lemonade stand. You have a person, the server admin, standing there. They take the money, they pour the lemonade into the cups, they guard the cash box. If that person falls asleep, or if they corrupt the money, or it gets stolen, or the lemonade gets poisoned, the protocol model is a vending machine made of a reinforced steel. There is no in person inside you. You put the money in the machine, follows a program set of rules, the code, and dispenses the product. You can't bribe the vending machine. You can't trick it into giving you free drinks by talking to it. And most importantly, the vending machine doesn't get tired or forget to lock its doors. Now, let's look at the North Korean threat, the insider, the spy who gets hired. Okay, in the traditional world, if a North Korean spy, say, gets hired as a senior engineer at a tech company, Google, Microsoft, they have admin privileges. Yeah, we get that. They can push code. They can change the database. They are a trusted user within the company. This is a weakness of centralized trust because we trust a person because they passed a background check, but holders. And if that North Korean spy tries to push, say, malicious code, let's say that code that steals user funds, they can't just hit enter on a platform like the internet computer. No, no, because changes to the code often require a proposal and a vote. The network itself has to agree to the upgrade or changes. So even if the spy is inside, they are handcuffed. They cannot act unilaterally. That reminds me of a concept of dual control. And in banking, when I was dealing with high value wire transfers, no single person could ever send money out of the bank. No, no. One person had to initiate the wire and a second, completely different person had to approve it. We called it the four eyes principle. It didn't matter if the first person was a criminal or being blackmailed. They literally could not steal the money alone. The system, it physically prevented it. The current internet doesn't have this. Usually the keys to the kingdom, they cannot delete the database alone. Like the shift to decentralized infrastructure applies that the four eyes principle to the entire internet because it treats every code update like a high value wire transfer. It assumes that anyone could be a bad actor so it removes the power from the individual. We have talked about technology, but now this is expensive. It is inefficient. It's like buying a car, but then having to buy the wheels, the brakes, and the seatbelts separately from different vendors and hoping they all fit together. Just say when security, identity, and database management are built into the internet itself, you don't need to buy all those extra tools. Think of it, it's cleaner, it's cheaper, and it's much, much safer. Think about how we moved from, say, physical gold to digital banking back in the day. If you had, say, wealth, you had to protect it yourself. You needed a safe. You needed a guard dog, for example. You needed a weapon, maybe. That was expensive and stressful. Then we invented a banking system where the security was handled by the institutions. You didn't need a guard dog anymore. You just needed a bank account. Simple. But right now, in the digital world, every company is still trying to protect their own gold with their own guard dogs. We are standing at the crossroads right now. One path, we stay with the status quo. We keep patching the holes. We keep hiring more security guards. We keep hoping that, say, the North Korean operatives don't get better at Photoshop. But as Amazon warned, the threats are scaling. They are automating. The open window is becoming primary liability for the entire global economy. When we're talking cybercrime at 11 trillion, on the other path, we set that experiment on the last 30 years, the client server model has run its course. We move towards a world where applications are immutable, where identity is cryptographic, not a username and password, where the IT stack disappears, replaced by a world computer. This isn't just about protecting data. It's about protecting the infrastructure of our daily lives. We started by looking at the terrifying reality of state-sponsored cyber warfare. We saw how Russian intelligence is weaponizing our laziness and how North Korean actors are exploiting our trust. We learned that these aren't just failures of people. They are failures of the architecture we use. And everything comes together when we see it from this angle. And it's not a battle of just say, good guys 
versus bad guys. It's a battle of old architecture versus new architecture. And history tells us that the better technology always wins in the end. And more importantly, stay curious and let your journey continue. Because everything we've explored today, from the hidden walls in our servers to the architectures that could end them, change the way you see the digital world forever. We often feel hopeless when we read the headlines. I know, it feels like the chaos is growing. But remember, chaos is often the symptom of a system that is ready to evolve. The choices we make today about what technology we build and what technology we trust shapes tomorrow's stories. Drop a comment below and I want to hear your thoughts and experiences. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss the next adventure. And remember to stay decentralized and I will see you on the internet computer. Until next time.